I'm telling you to go there, and I haven't even, even started looking. Um, Mark chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 17 and 18 as our text. And if you have found your place, if you would, let's stand as we read our text. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for, again, this opportunity to meet together, to look into your word and to find out what it actually teaches. And Lord, help us to understand the truth of it. Help us not to be confused uh, by the uh, popular opinions that uh, go around. And uh, Lord, I just pray that our faith would be founded directly on your word. And Lord, have your will and way now in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So here we are uh, looking at what Baptists believe about the sign gifts. And uh, uh, well, we could spend weeks, uh, seriously, we could spend weeks looking at all of this. I have at uh, different times and different places spent a number of weeks dealing with uh, the whole issue of sign gifts because there is a great deal of confusion about it. Uh, and not only because there's a great deal of confusion about it, but let's be honest, uh, it is the charismatic movement which bases itself on the sign gifts that is really driving the ecumenical one world church movement of today. And so it's something that we need to be aware of from a biblical standpoint rather than just he said, she said sort of a thing. And so it is an important thing. So one of the unique things about true Bible Christianity is the dispensing of spiritual gifts from the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit to the members of a New Testament church for the functioning of that particular church. And we have some scripture here we want to read. 1 Corinthians 12. And uh, verse number 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. In verse 11 uh, but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. In other words, the Holy Spirit gives to each individual a spiritual gift. And, and for some, he'll give one gift. For some, he'll give many, uh, several different gifts, depending on you know, what he wants to do. And uh, that's just what he does over in Ephesians chapter 4, and verses 7 and 8. But... Uh, unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. If you follow the context through, you find that these spiritual gifts that are talked about here in Ephesians chapter 4, again, they're given in the context of a church, but they are people that are given as gifts. Uh, because you find in verse 11, he gave some apostles some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so uh, that's how that is. And then over in 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse number 10, the scripture says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So uh, that is a unique thing that God has. If we're saved, God gives us spiritual gifts, at least one spiritual gift, a gift that we are to use for the edification, for the building up, for the benefit of the church that God has placed us into. Now, some of these spiritual gifts uh, back in the day were sign gifts, and that's what we read in our text. In, in uh, Mark 16 and verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if any drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. But here's the thing. We as, as Baptists believe that the sign gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is what our text deals with, such as speaking in tongues, the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, were temporary. These various sign gifts ceased with the completion of the Word of God. <clears throat> And we're not going to finish this whole lesson this afternoon. I know this. So you have to come back next week to get all of this. Um, but all of this is important. 
it's all important to, to be able to get uh, just a brief glimpse of the scope of um, what the Word of God is talking about in the area of the sign gifts. So the purpose of the sign gifts, so Scripture teaches that these sign gifts were for the purpose of accreditation. Uh, and of course, that is the action or process of officially recognizing someone as having a particular status or being qualified to perform a particular activity. You realize that's what a driver's license is supposed to be. That's supposed to be your accreditation that you actually know how to drive. Now, I've told you before, I was a driver's license examiner down in Texas, and I know we had people come in from all over the world. Uh, and I love to tell the story, the story about the, the young lady from um, Sri Lanka who came in. She couldn't even figure out how to roll down the window in the car she was in. Uh, she, oh, it was bad. It was just bad from the start. She, she did not need a license. In any, uh, it, it was dangerous just to have her taking a test. And uh, I, was, I was very glad. I was just in training at the time, so it wasn't up to me. Uh, but I was very glad when she failed and didn't get a license because she wasn't qualified. She had no business being out on the road. Uh, but I know also other, other road tests I would take, uh, they would say, well, you know, I, I have a driver's license back home. But back home, everything is standard transmission, so they're not used to automatic for one thing. And then also, they're, they're used to right-hand steering, so they're used to driving on the left-hand side of the road. Mm -hmm. And we would come out to the boulevard, and I would say, okay, we need to take a left. And so they would take a left into oncoming traffic, because that's the lane they're used to driving in. And uh, yeah, I was real glad to fail them as well because you know that that scared me. But a driver's license is a form of accreditation, saying that yes, I know how to drive, I know what I'm doing. And in 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 the same way, the sign gifts were given for the purpose of accreditation to show that yes, this person or this message, as we'll see, is real. It is the true thing. And uh, so the sign gifts accredited God's man. And, and we see this all the way back in Exodus chapter 4 even. Uh, going back there, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2. And the Lord said unto him, speaking to Moses, uh, this is at the burning bush, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Moses was not a stupid man. He ran away from the snake. But in verse 4, the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. And here's what God says in verse 5. That they may believe the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. In other words, this sign gift that he received, and there's more here in the context, that he talks about, but this sign gift of casting down the rod and it becoming a serpent, and then him taking it by the tail and it becomes a rod again, that sign gift was for the purpose of getting accreditation to Moses that he's not just coming in out of the desert because he's got sunstroke and he's had you know all these hallucinations that he's talking about. He really did see God. He really has heard from God, and that's that's what that purpose was. Over in John chapter 20. John chapter 20 and uh, verses 30 and 31 says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so these miracles that are found throughout the book of John, they're there for the purpose of proving that Jesus is Christ, that proving that he is the Son of God. And even Jesus said that, you know, if you don't believe me for what I say, believe me for the very work's sake, for the things that I'm doing, uh, because they prove that I came from God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, Paul says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And so Paul says, I proved that I was an apostle, or that I am an apostle, because of the signs that, uh, that I was able to uh, perform. So the sign gifts accredited or proved the, the, the validity of God's man, but also 
proved the validity of God's message back in our text in uh, Mark chapter 16. Of course, we read in verse 17 and 18 where it talked about these signs and so on. But in verse 20, the very last verse of the book of Mark, it says, And they went forth and preached everywhere. Well, that's great. But there's more to it than that. It says, The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So what is the reason for the sign gift? To confirm, to accredit, to prove that the message they were preaching was right. So that's, that's the reason, that's the purpose for these sign gifts. Now, let's, let's talk about this. What is, uh, if you've dealt with anyone of a charismatic or Pentecostal persuasion who talks about the sign gifts, they will say, you need to, and they usually talk about speaking in tongues. That, that's usually the big one that they talk about. You need to do that essentially to prove that you're saved. You know, that's why you speak in tongues, because it shows that you're saved. That is not what this says. That's not what the Word of God says is the purpose of, of uh, these sign gifts at all. Let's go on and talk about the provision of sign gifts. These sign gifts were not for the purpose of proving God's man or God's message to the Gentiles. It was for the purpose of proving God's man and God's message to the Jews. Because the Jews, they were a bunch of knuckleheads. And, uh, and we know that because that's what it says in the Hebrew and the Greek. And, and I'm, I'm kidding about that, saying that. But uh, throughout the Bible, God talks about the Jews. They're stiff-necked. They're hard-hearted. They're, in the book of Ezekiel, talks over and over about Israel having a stony heart. And uh, not a heart of flesh. It's not, it's not even real. It's just, it's just a rock. A piece of rock heart that they have. And, uh, and, and they're so fleshly minded, the Jews were, and, and still are to a great degree. But it is the Jews that required the sign. And these sign gifts were really directed specifically toward them. When God said to Moses, here, I want you to do this with the serpent, was that so that he could do that in front of Pharaoh? Now, he did some of those things in front of Pharaoh. But is that the reason why God gave him those signs to do? No, it was for the Jews. And we already read that. And uh, so, and we'll probably read it again here in a second. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 22 says this, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So the Greeks, they want, you know, they want the... The apologetics, as it were. I want you to explain to me why I ought to believe this. I want you, you know, <clears throat> before I believe this, I want you to help me understand it. Well, of course, that doesn't work either. Uh, because if you understand all of it, then there's not any faith involved. But for the Jews, they required a sign. And that, that's what they wanted back in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, and verse number 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? You see, they needed, they required a sign. They needed that sign back over in the book of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 38. Here it says, Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So, you know, they wanted the sign all the way back in Exodus, and then you go forward several, several centuries, and you have the Jews coming to Jesus, and they're looking for a sign as well. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and verse number 21, we find this verse, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all this... Will they not hear me, saith the Lord? So again, this is talking about the, the sign gift of tongues, is what it's talking about. And, uh, it, and it's a quote from Isaiah 28, 11. But again, it's a sign to the Jews. So <clears throat> that's what it's for. It's for the purpose of proving the man of God and the message of God. And it's for 
the Jews, especially unbelieving Jews, as, uh, as we see. So then again, talking about when people talk about the gift of tongues today, they don't talk about doing it for the Jews at all. They, they do it in their church service just for themselves. See, that again, that's contrary to what the scripture teaches about the sign gifts. And uh, again, there are other things as well we can talk about, but, but let's go back to our text here. And in our text, we see the profile of sign gifts. And we see that Jesus enumerates essentially four different categories or four different uh, sign gifts here. In verse 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so you have essentially these four different things. There's casting out devils, speaking in tongues, taking up deadly serpents, which obviously would be a miracle, and then, uh, of course, healing, uh, that of healing. Then uh, we see the prophecy concerning each of these gifts has already been fulfilled. So let, let's look at this, casting out devils in Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, let's see, has this actually been fulfilled? Acts chapter 16 and verse number 18 says, And this uh, did she many days. And Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So here we have the fulfillment of that prophecy. So now here he's, the Apostle Paul cast out a devil out of this woman. Then back over in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2. In verse number 4, you find, the, speaking in tongues, you find that being fulfilled. In verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Over in Acts 28, you see the fulfillment of taking up of deadly serpents. Acts chapter 28, in verse 3. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, who, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Isn't that amazing? Um, I don't know if you, you know played around with any poisonous snakes before, but usually, you know, when someone is bitten by a poisonous snake, uh, they're not in the same boat as Paul. They feel harm. You know, they're, they're you know, they begin to swell, and, and of course, the, the venom begins to do its work in the body, uh, whatever type of snake it is, uh, however that works. So, Paul did that and fulfilled what we read in our text in Mark 16. And then here in Acts 3, you see healing. You see a fulfillment of that. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 6. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And uh, he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. So all of these things that Jesus said would happen have been fulfilled. And so since they've been fulfilled, is there any need for us to look for them to be fulfilled again? Let me put this into perspective. Uh, there are a great number of prophecies of the Old Testament that talk about Messiah coming, that talk about his first coming as well as his second coming. Now, in Jesus' first coming, he fulfilled every prophecy concerning Messiah's first coming. He fulfilled every one. So then, should we be looking for someone to come and fulfill those prophecies again? Why would we do that? Because they've already been fulfilled. And, and, and so, using that same thought, if these have been fulfilled, why would we look for them to be fulfilled still? 
and to continue to be fulfilled when they already have been. And then also, here's this other idea. So again, uh, tongues is usually the, uh, the one gift that's singled out of the sign gifts. That's singled out more than any other. And uh, oh yes, we believe in speaking in tongues and it's still for today. And that's, that's, what, uh, that's what these people teach and that's what they, that's what they believe. But look, if they're going to believe that, they have to believe all of these things. So if they believe that they have the ability to uh, speak in tongues, then they should also be able to cast out devils. They individually, not somebody somewhere, they need to be able to ha uh, have that power uh, to do that. Not only that, then they also should be able to handle serpents. But not only that, they should also be able to, as it tells us in verse 18, they should be able to drink poison without any effect. Because that's what it says. Right? Look at verse 18 again. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So <clears throat> they talk about, they want to emphasize tongues and then... Of course, they, they, some of them also emphasize healing uh, in, in faith healers and that sort of thing. They emphasize those two things, but they want to skip the other ones. But no, if you're going to, to say these are still good today and we have these gifts today, then they had better be showing us examples where they sat down and they drank arsenic and they drank strychnine and it did not hurt them at all. They need to be able to do those things. You say, well, that would be stupid. Of course it would be stupid. But if they're not going to do that, then they ought not be trying to do the other either. See? Because it all goes together. You can't cherry pick and say, well, you know, this is good and, and this is not. and You just can't do that. Uh, we're going to go on, and uh, I'm not going to go very far with this, but let's go on and see about the passing of the signed gifts. Since the gift of tongues is one of the signed gifts and it has an expiration date, we can safely deduce that all of the signed gifts were temporary. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And uh, those who believe in the signed gifts, that they're still active today, they hate this, this passage of Scripture. They, they despise it. Uh, and they call this, uh, they call it uh, the cessation doctrine, and, and they, they try to vilify anybody that believes that these sign gifts were only temporary, that they're not active today. Uh, but here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, it says, Charity never faileth, never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. What is prophecy? Sometimes we use prophecy to talk about simply like what I'm doing now, standing in the pulpit and, and preaching, proclaiming God's word. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about prophecy in the sense of foretelling the future. If there be prophecies, they shall cease. So, I mean, that makes it very clear. There's going to be an end to it. Uh, and and um, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So the, the sign gift of tongues, that's going to end. And it goes on, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. This is supernatural knowledge. And you, you find different examples of that throughout the book of Acts. And then in verse uh, 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So he says there's going to be something that's going to cause these things to cease and to not be necessary anymore. Again, these signs were specifically directed to the Jews. It's not just something we do because we're having church, so okay, let's all stand up and let's all speak in tongues now. That is not how this sign gift worked at all. In fact, if you read Acts chapter 2, you can see that, if you read it honestly. Uh, because it wasn't just... Uh, what they call a heavenly language, language of angels, and all the other things to talk about. It was known languages because the people said, we hear them in our language that we were raised in. We hear them speaking in our language, and we know they're not from where I'm from. They're from somewhere else. Uh, and, and so you have that, and of course those people were, were shocked. Um, 
But the sign gift, it was specifically directed to the Jews. And those people, while they were from different parts of the world, and, and their, their native tongue may have been from those different places in the world, they were Jews. They were of Jewish descent. And so obviously they had learned Hebrew, but Hebrew for them was not their first language. It was second language for them. And so their first language is what they're hearing the apostles speak in. And uh, again, it's an amazing thing. So the sign gifts were directed to the Jews. These sign gifts held a specific warning of imminent judgment upon the Jews at various times in their history. Let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And uh, let, let's see how this plays out. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49. Um, my pages seem to be sticking together. Um, Deuteronomy 28, 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And then look at verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which uh, neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even with the stone. So this is all part of the same context. We're just kind of tagging the beginning and the end uh, to get the idea. But it makes it real obvious. These people with speaking different tongues that aren't necessarily ones that you understand, uh, they're going to bring judgment. Back over in Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 and verse number 11. You know, back in the day when I was young, speaking of, of trying to find these verses, uh, <clears throat> we used to have uh, what we call youth rallies, where young people from a lot of different uh, independent Baptist churches there in, in western Michigan, we would get together. And I was, I was just a little kid. I never was really old enough to participate but because my dad was a pastor I was always there and uh, but <clears throat> my sister she she got old enough where she could participate and and they always had what they called uh, sword drills or Bible drills and uh, you you know hold your Bible up and they'd say a reference and you'd repeat that reference and they'd say go and and then you'd have to find that really fast and uh, then the first one to stand up and read it got the point and and so that's how they did that um, I used to be, I never got to participate then, but I used to be pretty good at that. Um, I don't know, there's something about this Bible right here, and it just it just doesn't cooperate. And I try and find places, and, and it, it just hides it from me for some reason. But Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11, goes on and talks about the same sort of thing. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And that uh, we read that again over in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, talking about that same thing. Uh, here again in Isaiah 33, in verse number 19. Isaiah 33, in verse number 19. Thou shalt not see a fierce people, a people of a deeper speech than thou canst perceive, of a stammering tongue that thou canst not understand. And again, the context there uh, is talking about the judgment of God coming. Then over in the book of Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse number 15 says, Lo, I will bring a nation upon thee from a far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say.